Now CNN's Sanjay Gupta on assignment for 60 Minutes. The chances are good that sugar is a bigger part of your daily diet than you may realize, which is why our story tonight is so important. New research coming out of some of America's most respected institutions is starting to find that sugar, the way many people are eating it today, is a toxin and could be a driving force behind some of this country's leading killers, including heart disease. As a result of these findings, an anti-sugar campaign has sprung up, led by Dr. Robert Lustig, a California endocrinologist, who believes the consumption of added sugars has plunged America into a public health crisis. Is sugar toxic? I believe it is. Do you ever worry that that just sounds a little bit over the top? Sure, all the time. But it's the truth. Dr. Robert Lustig is a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of California, San Francisco, and a pioneer in what is becoming a war against sugar. Motivated by his own patients, too many sick and obese children, Dr. Lustig has concluded that sugar, more than any other substance, is to blame. What are all these various diseases that you say are linked to sugar? Obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease itself. Lustig says the American lifestyle is killing us. And most of it, you say, is preventable. 75% of it is preventable. While Dr. Lustig has published a dozen scientific articles on the evils of sugar, it was his lecture on YouTube called Sugar, the Bitter Truth, that brought his message to the masses. I'm standing here today to recruit you in the war against bad food. By bad food, Dr. Lustig means the obvious things, such as table sugar, honey, syrup, sugary drinks, and desserts, but also just about every processed food you can imagine, where sugar is often hidden. Yogurts and sauces, bread, even peanut butter. And what about the man-made, often vilified sweetener, high fructose corn syrup? Is it worse than just table sugar? No, because it's the exact same. They are basically equivalent. Problem is, they're both bad. They're both equally toxic. Since the 1970s, sugar consumption has gone down nearly 40%. But high fructose corn syrup has more than made up the difference. Dr. Lustig says they are both toxic because they both contain fructose. That's what makes them sweet and irresistible. We love it. We go out of our way to find it. And I think one of the reasons evolutionarily is because there is no foodstuff on the planet that has fructose that is poisonous to you. It is all good. <laughs> so when you taste something that's sweet, it's an evolutionary Darwinian signal that this is a safe food. We were born this way. We were born this way. Central to Dr. Lustig's theory is that we used to get our fructose mostly in small amounts of fruit, which came loaded with fiber that slows absorption and consumption. After all, who can eat 10 oranges at a time? But as sugar and high fructose corn syrup became cheaper to refine and produce, we started gorging on them. Americans now consume 130 pounds per person a year. That's a third of a pound every day. Dr. Lustig believes those sweeteners are helping fuel an increase in the most deadly disease in America, heart disease. For years, he's been a controversial voice. Here is our oral isotope. But now studies done by Kimber Stanhope, a nutritional biologist at the University of California, Davis, are starting to back him up. She's in the middle of a groundbreaking five-year study which has already shown strong evidence linking excess high fructose corn syrup consumption to an increase in risk factors for heart disease and stroke. That suggests calories from added sugars are different than calories from other foods. The, the, the mantra that you hear from most nutritionists is that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. And I think the results of the study showed clearly that is not true. Stanhope's conclusions weren't easy to come by. Nutrition studies are expensive and difficult. Stanhope has paid groups of research subjects to live in this hospital wing for weeks at a time, under a sort of 24-hour lockdown. They undergo scans and blood tests. Every calorie they ingest meticulously weighed and prepared. They're never out of our sight. So we do know that they are consuming exactly what we need them to consume. And they're not sneaking 
Any candy bars on the right. side. Yeah, exactly. For the first few days, participants eat a diet low in added sugars, so baseline blood levels can be measured. So remember, you guys have to finish all your Kool-Aid. Then 25% of their calories are replaced with sweetened drinks. And Stanhope's team starts drawing blood every 30 minutes around the clock. And those blood samples? They revealed something disturbing. And what are you starting to see? We found that the subjects who consumed high fructose corn syrup had increased blood levels of LDL cholesterol and other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. How quickly did these changes occur? Within two weeks. Kimber Stanhope's study suggests that when a person consumes too much sweet stuff, the liver gets overloaded with fructose and converts some of it into fat. Some of that fat ends up in the bloodstream and helps generate a dangerous kind of cholesterol called small dense LDL. These particles are known to lodge in blood vessels, form plaque, and are associated with heart attacks. Did it surprise you when you first uh, got these results back? I would have to say I was surprised because when I saw our data, I started drinking a, and eating a whole lot less sugar. <laughs> I would say our data surprised me. So imagine, for these healthy young people, drinking a sweetened drink might be just as bad for their hearts as the fatty cheeseburgers we've all been warned about since the 1970s. That's when a government commission mandated that we lower fat consumption to try and reduce heart disease. Major coronary risk factors. So with the best of intentions, they say, time to reduce fat in the American diet. Exactly. And we did. And guess what? Heart disease, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and death are skyrocketing. Dr. Lustig believes that's primarily because we replaced a lot of that fat with added sugars. When you take the fat out of the food, it tastes like cardboard. And the food industry knew that. So they replaced it with sugar. The, this idea that sugar uh, increases this particularly bad LDL, the small, dense particles that are associated with heart disease. Do most doctors, do they know this? No, they do not know this. So this, this is, is new. And it turns out sugar has become a major focus in cancer research, too. Lewis Cantley is looking at the connection. If you limit your sugar, you decrease your chances of developing cancer. Absolutely. Cantley, a Harvard professor and the head of the Beth Israel Deaconess Cancer Center, says when we eat or drink sugar, it causes a sudden spike in the hormone insulin, which can serve as a catalyst to fuel certain types of cancers. What we're beginning to learn is that insulin can cause adverse effects in various tissues. And of particular concern is cancer. Why? Nearly a third of some common cancers, including breast and colon cancers, have something called insulin receptors on their surface. Insulin binds to these receptors and signals the tumor to start consuming glucose. So this is your body eating... Every cell in our body needs glucose to survive. But the trouble is, these cancer cells also use it to grow. So if you happen to have a tumor that has insulin receptors on it, then it will get stimulated to take up the glucose that's in the bloodstream. So rather than going into the fat or the muscle, the glucose now goes into the tumor, and the tumor uses it to grow. So you've just seen that tumor turn blue, which is essentially uh, reflective of the glucose going into it. That's right. So these cancers, much in the same way that muscle will say, hey, I'd like some of that glucose. The fat says, I would like some of that glucose. The cancers have learned how to do this themselves as well? Yes, so they have evolved the ability to hijack that flow of glucose that's going by in the bloodstream into the tumor itself. Lewis Cantley's research team is working on developing drugs that will cut off the glucose supply to cancer cells and keep them from growing. But until there's a breakthrough, Cantley's advice, don't eat sugar. And if you must, keep it to a minimum. In fact, uh, I, you know, I live my life that way. I rarely eat sugar. When you, when you see a sugary drink, or if I were to offer you one, what, with all that you know, what's going through your mind? Um, I probably would turn it down and get a glass of water. <laughs> but for most of us, that's easier said than done. Turns out sugar is much more addictive than I think we had sort of realized early on. Eric Stice, a neuroscientist at the Oregon Research Institute, is using functional MRI scanners to learn how our brains respond to sweetness. Sugar activates the brain in a special way uh, that's, that's very reminiscent of, of you know, drugs like cocaine. That's right. 
cocaine. All right, let's, let's give it a shot. I climbed into the MRI scanner to see how my brain would respond. That's a straw that's been rigged to deliver a tiny sip of soda into my mouth. Stay as still as you can, okay? Just as it hit my tongue, the scanner detected increased blood rushing to certain regions of my brain. In these images, the yellow areas show that my reward region is responding to the sweet taste. Dopamine, a chemical that controls the brain's pleasure center, is being released, just as it would in response to drugs or alcohol. So dopamine's released, that sort of mm -hmm. makes me feel good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing some pleasure from having this kick. Right, that euphoric effect. So far be it for people to realize this, because sugar is everywhere, mm -hmm. but you're saying this is one of the most addictive substances possibly that we have. It certainly is very good at firing the, the reward regions in our brain. Eric Stice says by scanning hundreds of volunteers, he's learned that people who frequently drink sodas or eat ice cream or other sweet foods may be building up a tolerance, much like drug users do. As strange as it sounds, that means the more you eat, the less you feel the reward. The result? You eat more than ever. If you overeat these on a regular basis, it causes changes in the brain that basically it blunts your reward region response to the food, so then you eat, eat more and more to achieve the same satisfaction you felt originally. With all this new science emerging, we wanted to hear from the sugar industry. So we visited Jim Simon, who's on the board of the Sugar Association, at a sugar cane farm in Louisiana. Would it surprise you that um, almost every scientist that we talked to uh, in, in researching this story told us they are eliminating all added sugars. Mm -hmm. They're getting rid of it because they're concerned about the health impacts. To say that, that, that uh, the American consuming public is going to completely el eliminate uh, sweeteners out of their diet, I don't think gets us there. Simon cautions that eliminating sugar wrongly vilifies one food, rather than working toward the long-term solution of reducing calories and exercising. You know, a lot of people, Jim, are saying that sugar is different. It is bad for your heart and causing a lot of the problems that we are talking about. It is addictive and in some cases might even fuel cancers. What would you, I mean, you've looked at this. You must have looked at some of these studies. What, what, what do you say about that? Science is not completely clear here. But some, and, but, but some, of, that, but some of these studies exist. I mean, what, what is a consumer, what, what are they to make of all that? Well, I would say to them that they've got to approach uh, their diet in balance. Dr. Robert Lustig agrees. We need a balanced diet. But his idea of balance is a drastic reduction in sugar consumption. To that end, he co-authored an American Heart Association report recommending men should consume no more than 150 calories of added sugars a day, and women just 100 calories. That's less than the amount in just one can of soda. Ultimately, this is a public health crisis. And when it's a public health crisis, you have to do big things and you have to do them across the board. Tobacco and alcohol are perfect examples. We have made a conscious choice that we're not going to get rid of them, but we are going to limit their consumption. I think sugar belongs in this exact same wastebasket.